Actually, my relation with Cambodia goes back even further than that. I was last here in Phnom Penh and 43 years ago. And I flew in the other day on Dragon Air from Hong Kong, no problem. But 43 years ago, I escaped with lots of other refugees in the so-called Phnom Penh airlift as the Khmer Rouge army was uh, taking Phnom Penh. Uh, an exciting period in my life as a, you know, as a long-haired uh, backpacking uh, student in, in the area. So uh, Rada asked me to talk about the uh, health side of things. Uh, that's, uh, you know, this is the clean as the part of the uh, Clean Cook Stove Alliance. Uh, what does clean mean and why are we worried about it? Uh, and that you know, relates to the new Global Burden of Disease Assessment. And then uh, also she asked me a bit to talk a little bit about what I see that means for the future for us. So I'm going to quickly run through this. Uh, it's a little bit of a primer, but I think that was part of the idea to bring us all on the same page in terms of these health effects. Now in the environmental health area, we often use this pathway analysis. We're worried about health, but our, most of our control efforts are at the other end of the pathway. So we have sources of pollution, maybe the emissions of that pollution, um, the concentration in the ambient environment, but the exposure to individuals the, is what really counts. And some things we can understand how much actually gets in the body, the so-called dose. So I'm just gonna run through this quickly and show you why we're here. Why is this problem a severe one? So, source. Well, the source, you know what it is? It's uh, solid fuels. Uh, mainly wood, which we've been using for two million years as a species, crop residues we've been using for 10,000 years, and coal in certain parts of the world for a thousand years or so. These are the sources of the heavy pollution. What about emissions? Well, I'm not going to go into detail, but let's just take wood smoke. These are the kinds of nasty stuff in wood smoke. It's uh, the standard air pollutants here, but here's a vast range of um, chemicals, and these are known toxic elements of the, that type of chemical, so maybe some of your favorite things, benzene, formaldehyde, dioxin, even butadiene, and so forth, are represented in wood smoke. It's a nasty bunch of stuff. It's very similar, in fact, to the most well-studied biomass smoke in the world, which is tobacco. A typical wood fire is about 400 cigarettes an hour worth of smoke. So when I show you these large health effects and you think about 400 cigarettes an hour in somebody's kitchen with women and children there, maybe it's not so surprising anymore. Most people now accept that sticking burning stuff in your mouth is not a good idea. But sticking a lot of burning stuff in your kitchen is not a good idea either. Uh, what about concentrations? Well, here are some data from India. Uh, typical uh, levels of pollution. I just took a few of the pollutants here. Uh, and typical health-based standards. You don't need to know the units to see that these are much larger than those. Now, we can't measure everything all the time in, um, uh, in these mixtures of pollutants. We, uh, so we usually use small particles as the best single indicator um, called PM 2.5, uh, below a certain size. You can penetrate into the deep lungs. But what about exposure? Doesn't matter if it produces a lot of emissions if nobody's there to breathe it. Well. This is the very first uh, woman in human history to have her um, exposure measured during the oldest task in human history. It's the oldest task because the control of fire is the defining moment for us changing from pre-human to human state two million years ago. It was in 1981. And um, uh, here you can see uh, her air pollution exposure is being measured as a pump here and a filter here right in her breathing zone. And those results were roughly 5,000 micrograms of PM during the cooking time. And if you take that over 24 hours, it's about 500. Now, I know maybe you don't know these numbers in your head. Is that big or little? Well, um, let's talk about the health effects of this pollution. So how much PM 2.5 is unhealthy? Remember, this woman in India had 500 micrograms. Now, we've done hundreds of studies, done tens of thousands of measurements since, and the numbers are very similar. A few hundred micrograms, typical. 24-hour uh, averages in these settings. Well, the WHO says it shouldn't be more than 10, as compared to that woman had 500. Um, and uh, you know, maybe uh, given that uh, you can't, everybody can't be very clean all the, uh, right away, that 35 is the very highest you should allow. So this is a long way from 500. Anything above that is quite unhealthy. 
Now take the US EPA, used to have 15 micrograms until it changed in last December, now it's 12. California's had 12 as the standard uh, for some years. Those are the strictest standards in the world, not even at the WHO level yet, but we're far from that in our households. Well, uh, how much ill health is created then by the sequence of source emissions, concentration, exposure? Uh, well, this is the new burden of disease assessment published in The Lancet um, a couple of months ago, 500 authors or so. Um, the metrics used in these assessments are first, of course, premature mortality. I don't really, I said mortality here, but it's everybody has to die, so it's premature mortality we're worried about. But it doesn't really a very good indicator because it treats uh, this, an 88 year, a death of an 88 year old at the end of uh, uh, their lives at the same as an 18 year old with their lives, you know, truncated. So a better metric is so-called DALI's disability adjusted life year, which does account for prematurity of the death. It also includes uh, a factor for the ill health, the non-fatal disease that one might have. And it uses the best life expectancy in the world is 86, uh, saying basically that everybody ought to be living that long. And the degree they're not living that long is an indication of the risk factors in, you know, that's causing ill health. So what diseases do we know about? Well, these are the ones we know in children and pneumonia. Um, uh, now, what do I mean by we know? I mean, we have multiple studies that um, you know, pass the uh, evidence uh, you know, test, if you will, in the burden of disease, you know, peer review, if you like. Uh, we have other evidence of other diseases, but they didn't quite, we couldn't put them quite above the line. We have evidence of tuberculosis, for example, low birth weight and other things that uh, might serve in some circumstances, but didn't serve in this big comparative eff uh, effort. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in women, lung cancer, blindness in the form of cataracts, and heart disease. Those are what we, the diseases we're able to put forward with sufficient evidence of different kinds to count in this burden of disease assessment. But I guarantee you, we have this meeting in 10 years, we're gonna add six or seven or eight or nine more diseases to this. Basically, and I know what diseases they are. They're the same diseases that are caused by smoking. Because this is stick, not sticking burning stuff in your mouth, but it's sticking burning stuff in your kitchen, there are a lot of it. And it's gonna be, it's the same set of diseases, just at lower risk, it's not as bad, but it's the same set. So this is the result, um, Rada mentioned the top ones here. Household higher blood pressure, tobacco smoking, including secondhand smoke, alcohol use, and here's household air pollution from solid fuels, number four in the world. And that includes you know, the 60% of the world that doesn't have any exposure because we're using uh, gas and electricity. So this, this here is just from the 40% of the world that's using dirty fuels. Um, now, if you like deaths instead, the premature deaths are in millions. Um, blood pressure is nine, the alcohol is about eight. Tobacco is about six, including secondhand tobacco smoke. Household air pollution is 3.5. But we have now a new category, secondhand smoke cooking, not secondhand smoke tobacco. So what is secondhand cooking smoke? Well, that's the fact that when you have dirty fuels in a house, it doesn't just stay in the house or around the house, it goes downwind, becomes part of outdoor air pollution in general. So household air pollution is a significant part of outdoor air pollution in many countries. And I'll show some data from India shortly. So that's the second-hand cook smoke. So the two together make the, five, the four million that Rada mentioned and is the final number. Uh, overweight, um, you know, and here's a bunch of other major risk factors. I, you know, we don't know these so accurately to say that there's that much difference between this and that. These are all um, the big risk factors in the world that we need to worry about uh, as public health people. If you look at Asia, uh, you know, specific parts of the world, here's South Asia, now dominated by India. In 1990, child, you know, malnutrition was still the biggest impact, but fortunately, we've been able to deal with that some. Uh, household air pollution has gone to number one. And here are some of the chronic diseases that are starting to be very important in, uh, in poor countries, uh, middle-income countries, particularly like India, high blood pressure, and um, so forth. So, um, in India, if you like deaths, about 900,000 annual premature deaths in India from household air pollution. It's about one quarter of the global total, and it's about one quarter of the global total of uh, biomass stoves. Secondhand cooked smoke is about 150,000 more, so about a million altogether. It's about 10% of national mortality, about the same as tobacco. The difference, of course, is that babies don't smoke, so the, the tobacco doesn't cause directly any impact in the very small children, but household air pollution does. So this um, section here of uh, this color here represents heart disease. 
And that's one of the new thing, the main new thing that's been added uh, this time in the global burden of disease compared to the time it was done about 10 years ago. And, um, uh, and we perhaps don't have quite as much evidence for that, I would say, uh, as we do for some of the other things in these particular settings. And so that, I would say, is a kind of research priority to just, you know, to um, validate, if you will, that heart disease, how exactly how big that heart disease is. But even without it, it's still a major risk factor in the world uh, and consequently, um, you know, an important uh, disease factor globally. But it is, um, this heart disease is now, you know, a significant part of it. All right, the framing of this risk factor is a bit different. Um, you notice I haven't used the word indoor air pollution and um, um, it's not uh, recommended anymore that um, when I, uh, in this, because uh, it's the juice of solid fuels uh, and there's much less confusion with space heating than before. Um, uh, and so our estimates of the use of solid fuels is, uh, this is what they are, about 41% globally. And you see it's one to one with poverty more or less. It is a poverty related <laughs> indicator. This has implications obviously for interventions. It's very hard, to, you know, the poor people can't afford to buy much. Uh, nobody makes anything for them because they can't make any money for it, for, with it. That makes it a difficult. It also makes it difficult to do the health research because poverty has a lot of impacts on health. And uh, you know, how, which of those are operating through the, the poor fuels and which of them are operating through other ways. That's you know, the art and science of doing good health research. So the framing is not called indoor because uh, the ap it em enters the atmosphere after being produced, perhaps indoors. 16% globally of outdoor, important outdoor particle air pollution is due to households, it's our estimate. And uh, so consequently, a part of the burden of disease, as I mentioned, of the outdoor is actually attributable to households. So we grab some of the, house, the outdoor turf, if you like. They don't give it up, but we grab some of it. So they overlap, outdoor and household now. Uh, how much of that is it in some countries? Well, here is some data from NASA about, uh, based on emission inventories showing the percent of total primary particle emissions from residential sources. And uh, here is uh, from zero to 100%. The redder it is, the higher it is. The overall estimate is about 25 to 30% of primary particle pollution in India is from household fuels. So it's uh, significant. It's bigger than the vehicle sector in India. Vehicle, bigger than the vehicle sector in China. Now there are other sources of pollution too, and coal and power plants and uh, you know, industries and, and so on. But uh, households are part of this problem. Indeed, um, this is uh, you know, the famous episodes in Beijing uh, last year, a couple of months ago, made the international news, very high particle levels inside uh, in, in, in Beijing, 300 micrograms here measured in a US embassy site. Remember, you know, in village households, this is a treat every day all over the world. But this is considered a lot of outdoor, real lot of outdoor air pollution. Well, we happen to, just happened to be measuring outside of Beijing in a village at that, that very day. So what do you think we found in the village? Outdoor, no, not even indoor. Well, we found even higher. And that pollution here is partly sharing the pollution that Beijing is, is having because this wasn't so far from Beijing, but also including the household uh, sources that are local. In this case, you know, doubling. I, this is just one day, so we can't draw too many conclusions from it, but it illustrates that outdoor air pollution is not confined to cities. It is in rural areas as well, substantial amounts of it, and a big part of it, not all of it, but a big part of it is from households. So household, our work is actually part of the necessary solution to outdoor air pollution in many countries. All right, important message number one. The full benefit from household air pollution only achieved by shifting to truly clean cooking, gas and electricity. That's how we did this assessment. It was compared to truly clean cooking, very clean environments. So you don't get that four, you won't get that four million, you know, death advantage unless you find ways to get really clean cooking. And we don't have too many ways to do that, except with gas and electricity, and we have very poor populations that can't afford it. So this is one of our primary dilemmas in this group. And in addition, um, just getting a little bit clean may not help much. This is uh, pretty good data from our site in Guatemala, uh, the Respire Project, looking at pneumonia and household air pollution. This is the dose response relationship, as it's called. This is the incidence of pneumonia locally and the um, amount of air pollution. And you can see these studies here are informed by outdoor air pollution studies, these data points here. These ones are 
uh, informed by secondhand tobacco smoke studies around the world. And these studies, uh, this level up here are from our work in Guatemala. And you can see that just decreasing by half the pollution level doesn't get you all that much benefit. You really have to start getting clean. You have to start getting down at least toward the WHO recommended levels around 35 before you start getting a major benefit. So this is part of this challenge of finding really clean in the, in the Alliance's name, getting clean, really clean. Important message number two, just because we know now, it's, now know it's a risk and I think the world is accepting it, not everybody yet really accepts as such a big risk in spite of this burden of disease, but it is certainly getting it on the map, doesn't mean we know how to fix it. And this is a very sobering thing. When did we learn that fecal matter, human waste in the water was bad for you? When did we learn that mosquitoes were bad for you? You might have thought we could have learned these 10,000 years ago. We didn't. It was about 100 years ago. 100 years ago, we've known that poor water and sanitation and mosquitoes were bad for you. Have we fixed it? No. We have millions of people dying of diarrhea from bad water, poor sanitation, and, and you know, exposure to mosquitoes. These are very difficult things to fix, and they all share common characteristics with us, the household air pollution people. Poor people, they have no money to buy things. Nobody makes any high-tech solutions for them because there's no money to be made there. Unhealthy alternatives are free. Go out and defecate in the fields or go gather a little biomass and burn an open fire, it's free and easily available. Cooks for you. Deals with your needs, your physical needs, so just go defecate in the fields. And with significant behavior change required to get people not only new technologies, but behavior change. These make it very difficult. It's not a simple problem. It's not something that just going out and tweaking a little stove somewhere, somewhere is gonna solve. To make it really clean, get people to use it, make it robust, make it a change in the whole character of their lives is what's needed. This is, makes it a very difficult problem and I think it's very sobering to see how long it's taken our colleagues in water and sanitation and you know, in bed nets and so forth. They've made some progress, but it's been long and not easy. Um, now, uh, we have a project funded by, partly funded by the Global Alliance here in India uh, called the Newborn Stove and I, the project. And I just want to illustrate one new bit of data that's come out. We've instrumented all that. We're, they're studying various things in, by introducing stoves to pregnant women. And um, uh, we're monitoring all the stoves to see how people use them. Now, we monitor not only the new stove. We're introducing the Philips stove, which is the cleanest uh, stove on the Indian market at the time we started. Uh, but we also instrument the old stove. Because the real issue is not just use of the new, but it's stopping the use of the old. Obviously, if they still use the old one, it doesn't matter if they use the new one in terms of air pollution. Got to stop using the old. So there are four patterns we've seen. This is very preliminary data. Here's the pattern you'd like to see. Here's the traditional, these are weeks here, so this is quite a bit of uh, data. Uh, here's uh, the use of the traditional stove is going along. She gets the Phillips stove, she starts using it, stops using the traditional, you know, one out of town this day. But you can see, um, this is what you like to see. The old goes out, the new comes in. That's great, but that's pattern number one. Pattern number two, she gets the Phillips, she uses both of them all the time. She likes it, but she doesn't stop using the old one. So presumably pollution you know, is added, there's more pollution here. Well, we haven't evaluated the pollution yet, but that's what it looks like. What about this one? Well, she uh, took on the Phillips and then she uses it some days and used the other one some, you know, some weeks and back and forth, it's the seesaw pattern. Um, and then there's number four. She tried the Phillips, hated it, went, went back, you know, never chopped using her traditional. So the average reduction in air pollution is hardly, you know, a one-to-one -one shift. And understanding why this happened in these households is one of the things we're trying to do, and we can, I can talk more about that later. All right, so for behavioral changes like other aspects of household air pollution studies, and this is the motto of my research group, as many of you know, is you don't get what you expect you get what you inspect, and sometimes it, get you, it tells you things you didn't want to know. Often. Now, last, a little thing, a little, uh, I don't know if anybody, you know, um, um, the Gapminder or the, um, the TED Talks by, um, uh, my favorite one is by Hans Ronsling, he right, has great TED Talks. Uh, particularly, though, I like the one, the magic washer machine, you can get it, uh, look it up on Google. So this is a little bit of apologies to him and, uh, and helped by one of my students. Uh, so here's one billion people each. So this is one billion people. 
So this is the, um, what do the richest one billion use for cooking? That's most of us in this room. What do you use for cooking? Gas. Gas, all right, gas or electric stove. But you forget, you're also using a whole bunch of electrical appliances. And each one time you use that, you don't have combustion in the kitchen, it's cleaner. So uh, an electric water pot, a uh, rice cooker, you know, a microwave, a toaster, and so forth. This is part of modern cooking. And so we, our fate is actually linked to electrification because these are very efficient devices. Even counting the losses in the electric lines and the power plant, they're very efficient at doing what they're doing and they're very clean at the household level. So this is part of the solution, at least for the top billion. So the f of the seven billion people in the world, four billion are using uh, you know, liquefied petroleum gas, natural gas, or electricity, and electricity rather, because they're using electrical appliances. But what about the other three billion? Uh, well, they're using open fires or, you know, fly, flames of various kinds, mostly in open situations. Um, so you might say this is the smoking section and this is the non-smoking section. That's a real Hans Rosling that's the statement. Um, what do we do about that? Well, um, here's the LPG. It's probably uh, roughly, you know, mostly in this with the poor end here and less the upper end and natural gas and more and electricity over the entire range. Um, uh, what about this uh, bottom three billion? Well, there are some differences here. These are people are mainly unpurchased wood, dung, and crop residues, but uh, uh, perhaps this group is you know, able to join the market, although not a lot of purchasing power, but this group is you know, pretty disenfranchised. Uh, this group over here, however, is already purchasing fuel. Coal, kerosene, charcoal, wood, electricity. They're already buying fuel. They're the ripe ones for one action. Oh, and then about half of this group uses electricity goes down to about here globally. Eventually we hope, of course, everybody has electricity, but right now it's all of this group basically and about half of that group. All right, so what do we want to do? The first thing we do, I think, is this. So move this group to here. Get them using clean fuels. We know that gas is clean. We know that electricity is clean. 60% of the world uses it already. We know people like it, use it. Every cuisine in the world can be cooked with it. No woman who uses gas, it's not gonna go back to an open fire. Move them there. They're paying for their fuel already, just have them pay for clean fuel. So that ought to be part of our task. But that still leaves this two billion down here who are not likely to be able to afford um, gas or electricity immediately. And that's um, you know, another um, challenge for us is uh, you know, what works with this group and then what is going to work with that group, the bottom billion can't afford really anything, gathering their own fuels, making their own stoves. That is a very difficult challenge for us. And of course, that's where most of the health effects are, is in that group. So um, I'm gonna uh, end there, I think. Um, um, sorry. Um, wanted to thank uh, the funders for our, our various um, studies, including the Global Alliance, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.